Yeah, so if you have uh, an area and it's too many players in that area, um, most servers just divide the area into smaller section and let and put one section on an, on on a different server that is not uh, not uh, as loaded. The problem is if too many players are in that section as well, you just have the same problem because you you can divide the area. You can uh, you can the scalability you get is fragmented. You don't really solve it. You just divide the problem. And here is how Abus line scales. Uh, instead of splitting the world into several sections and put different sections uh, on just one server, many servers can join together and say, oh, we will join uh, and uh, run this part of the world together. Uh, and every server basically helps out with everything, like chat, social events, terrain handling, everything. Uh, and game objects only exist in memory on one server, though. Uh, and all servers, they have a local and a distributed game object registry. So, uh, when you want to communicate with another, with another object, you look up it in the shared... You, you first look up it uh, in the local uh, re registry. And if it's not there, you look it up in the uh, distributed registry which means that the object is on, a, on another server and then you just send the messages as, as usual. Um, and I use Nisia for that. And Nisia is a key value database that is built into the urban language. Uh, so far I have not detected much problems with these solutions. I might do that in the future. Uh, I've done some basic stress tests with up to 24,000 logged in clients. Uh, they were basically uh, emulating player and uh, behavior. Uh, they were TCP uh, clients connecting and walking around in the world issuing random uh, commands. Uh, between 12,000 connected clients, my server uh, had response times between 10 and 20 milliseconds. Uh, when I got to 16,000 connected clients, the response time stopped to increase to 50 milliseconds. And at 20,000, I started. St I reached uh, reached a sort of uh, a, what can you say uh, upper limit when I started to get huge response times to two uh, between two and four seconds. Uh, the the hardware I did run on this was uh, I had uh, the connection server on a uh, uh, laptop <laughs> actually. Uh, one gigahertz Celeron with 512 megabyte RAM, and the area server was a uh, uh, AMD Phenom with 8 gigabyte RAM. So it was still desktop computer. It wasn't really, really server uh, hardware. Um, this is about how I handle messaging in the system. Uh, all TCP connections that are made to the uh, connection server, uh, they uh, make sure that the client does a successful account and character login. Uh, uh, when, once that is done, it creates a, uh, a play process on the correct server and start to let uh, messages pass. Um, each connection is a state machine. And it has a connected state, which means that the a TCP connection has been made. A lobby connection, which means that the player has logged in with their account. Uh, a plain state, which means that the player has chosen a character and is logged in into the world they're playing. And a connection lost when uh, the TCP socket is closed. So that is how I did handle messages. How I do handle logic uh, in the server, I have divided uh, all functionality into libraries. Mm. And they are like plugins. Uh, you, they can be start, stopped, and upgraded during runtime. Uh, 
for example, I, I had a guy running around in the world uh, and, and, and I set the speed in, in one of the libraries. And then I just went into the server, uh, changed the source code uh, to increase the, speed move, the movement speed to 10 times higher, recompiled and loaded in the new code. And suddenly the guy started from walking very slow to rushing past and he was like, oh, wow, this is so, so cool. So you can make those things without having to look up it in a database and stuff. It, it helps a great deal when it comes to speed to actually be able to, to, to hard code values but still be able to, be able to upgrade them uh, during runtime. Um, each library handles a specific task in the system like terrain or shaft or skills. Um, and those libraries basically they provide an API to each other and uh, game on it. And below is a screenshot of a tool called the Application Monitor. It's nothing I done myself, <laughs> it's quite ugly, but it shows you how you have the area. Uh, is there? Can you zoom in? Uh, yeah, I can zoom in. That, that, that is great. Uh, So, yeah, uh, you can see the, you have the, the uh, area server supervisor here, it has a library supervisor, so here we have a supervisor that is supervising the supervisor, and the, the, lib, the library supervisor is supervising, for example, the lib environment supervisor, and the lib environment supervisor is supervising the lib environment server. And, and, and so, for example, if this one crashes the, the server, the supervisor will automatically restart it. Um, and that is how you basically get high uptime in normal systems. And if you look at the... Here I've got a library called uh, libstandard. Uh, and libstandard has a libstandard server and another object supervisor. And the object supervisor is supervising all the objects in the server. So these, these three are actually three clients that are logged in. And if the, one of these player objects would crash, the supervisor would restart them. Which means that you can actually, the player code can crash without the player actually uh, noticing that something on the server crash, they can just still play. Uh, so the game libraries are implemented like, like a client server service, you know, so each library thinks itself as an own server which, which uh, serves clients. Uh, in general, each request, uh, for each request, uh, a new process is created that just deals with that request and then dies off. Since process is also cheap, it's, it means that you, you get uh, still high concurrency. And it means that if something goes wrong with one out of thousand requests, the other 999 won't, uh, won't be affected. Uh, and in my server, all the game objects, for example, players, trees, rocks, forks, houses, they are uh, a neural process, uh, which run the logic and hold the object state. Uh, not all game objects need to have a state at all times. Uh, generally, they have three different levels. The deep state means that the game object is only on disk, it doesn't consume any memory or process uh, uh, or CPU at, at all. Um, generally objects that are not interacting with for a long time goes into this state. And I have a shallow state, which consumes a little, little memory. Uh, it means that objects in this uh, state has its uh, position, scale, and orientation, the three dimensions uh, loaded, 
into memory. Only that. Because in 99%, it is what other processes or game models want to know. Um, if you want to interact with something, it has to be loaded uh, fully into memory and run in its own process. Because you have to send process uh, a message uh, to another process to communicate with that. So, uh, so that, that will hopefully allow a lot of objects to be loaded in the service. And here is how I handle uh, logic. Um, I did a number of different, actually, tryouts. Uh, first, I just had a pure Erlang process. With, I did hard code every, every message you see to it. It became a mess quite quick, quickly. Uh, so I refactored that into a more of an inheritance, uh, inheritance uh, system. And the inheritance system did, did not really work well in the, in the functional language. Uh, so I remade that a third time and ended up, ended up with uh, uh, using a chain of responsibility pattern. It keeps similar features as inheritance in object orientation, but it's not really the same. Mm -hmm. It basically means when a game object receives a message, uh, the game uh, object has some hierarchy of objects. Uh, you can see that uh, it first has a, a player object, and a living object, and a movable object, and at last um, the, the, the object, which is the base object for everything. Um, so it first sends a message to the player module, and if the player module cannot handle it, it passes it on to the, to the living, if the living cannot handle the message, it moves it to the movable, and if the movable cannot pass it or handle it, it passes it to the object. And if the object cannot handle it, it just throws the message away. Um, and for the morphism, it's quite easy because if you want to change, for example, a player from a player to to, to a plant, you can just change the player module to a plant module. And you basically have the new behavior. Now it's starting to get a bit hard to read. Uh, this is code migration. Uh, you see the lines of code there is actually all the code I need to during runtime move an object from a server to another server without uh, affecting its, its uh, availability. So this means that if one player um, hacks on a tree, I can actually move the player or the tree to another physical server while the player is hacking on it without anything being affected. They can just hack on it while it's being moved. I can zoom in here. So first, you can see in the, in the upper corner there, the migrate function it takes uh, one area server here, uh, the type of object and the state of the object, and if the area server I try to migrate, try to migrate to, it's the same as as the new node. Uh, I just return an error saying you can. There is no idea for you to migrate to the same server. Uh, if that is not the case, uh, I make a um, remote, remote processing call to the remote server saying to the object supervisor that you should start a new object with, the, with this type and that state and it will basically send this type and state to the new physical machine, a copy of that. <coughs> um, and I can get back either OK and the new process ID of the new um, of the new process or the migrator object, or I can get back an error and a reason, and then I just fail with that reason. If I didn't fail, I entered the migrate loop with the new PID. Uh, a PID is a process ID, which is a way of identifying processes in our own system. Uh, and you see I send in a number zero here as well. Uh, and the zero here is the number of 
messages that I have received. So if we look at the migrant loop here, yeah. this is uh, where Erlang's pattern matching comes in place. If my migrant loop is called with uh, max messages called, which means it's a thousand, which means basically I have received one thousand messages. Um, I'm going to unregister from my local object registry and report that I had been forced to migrate because uh, I got more than more than the maximum number of messages and I will not uh, uh, send more messages to the new object. And and, and here uh, is when, uh, in a normal case, as soon as I receive an event. I just send the event to the new process on the other server and then I increase my number of messages with one. You can see it here. So if I get more than a thousand messages, I just force, I just say, oh, I did manage to migrate success, successfully, but some other object sent me more than a uh, thousand events, so I just shut down and said, now it's enough. Or I can time out after one second. If I don't receive any messages in one second, I just 